this is uh, really an exciting day, actually, literally this day, uh, because of what it signifies. And so I want to uh, shape it. I think that uh, the things that have been happening over the last couple of years that are coming together are at the same time exciting and fragile. And I want to kind of focus our work. I have, we have a lot of pres uh, ideas from our books that are really coming from practice. The things that, uh, all the things I write about are things that we do with practitioners. So I'm a great plagiarizer of practitioners uh, in, in representing it uh, back and, and with many of you in this room. Uh, so let's be, let me say a little bit about Ontario, but not so much. Uh, it is the case that the Stewart Foundation funded three groups to come up, uh, 30 people or so, two or three days at a time. And uh, there are good things to see. And as Andy will say this afternoon in his uplifting leadership, uh, systems never imitate other systems. Successful systems never imitate other systems, but they learn from them and create their own version. And that's what I think is uh, happening here. We certainly have taken a stagnant system in Ontario uh, in 2003 and done a lot of things that got pay off immediately in terms of buy-in and, and uh, results. So literacy has gone up. With, uh, Ontario is about a third of the size of California, thir 13, 14 million people. Uh, we have 2,000 um, students in the public system, which 97% of the kids are in the public system, and uh, about 5,000 schools. So it's big enough, but not as big as you. And we have uh, high school graduation has zoomed up to 83% from 68%. The number of schools in, um, that were in low performance when we started out of the 4,000 uh, elementary uh, was 4,000 school, or 800 schools out of the 4,000, and is now 69. Deliberate attempts that are positive, positive emphasis on capacity building. Non-judgmentalism, but nonetheless insistent on growth and development. Uh, early learning, uh, halfway through, uh, or at least at the end of the first term, 2007, we uh, turned our attention to early learning and then over a three or four year period implemented uh, all four and five year olds in the province. 250,000 children are now in full day integrated, uh, uh, year four and year, uh, four and five year olds are in full day integrated uh, daycare and, uh, in, including the curriculum, the diagnosis, the preparation for grade one, all of those things. So it's a complete thing. It, it, it starts to get connected. When I say we, uh, I just want to talk about the external to California we and then the internal we here. Uh, there are about, uh, in our core group, about uh, four or five of us. Andy Hargraves, who obviously you'll be hearing from this afternoon, uh, he and I have teamed up for a long time, but especially in the last five years on this agenda. Uh, working on it in different jurisdictions, including this one. So Andy's uh, great. We have uh, Joanne Quinn, who's a chief capacity builder, fabulous. Uh, a fellow I hired last year, about 16 months ago, who just graduated from Harvard with Richard Elmore. Uh, her name, his name is Santiago Rincon Gallardo. He's fantastic, uh, chief of researcher. And then we have some people from the ministry who, Ministry of Education, who we uh, helped appoint inside the government led the reform inside the government and are now coming out into early retirement and working with us as part of the team. Mary Jean Gallagher was presented, for example, up uh, in Ontario. So there's a lot of uh, combination, but it's really the partnerships we have here. And I probably uh, couldn't name them all, uh, although many of them in the room, but I'll, I'll try to uh, say some of the more uh, direct ones we have. Uh, by partnerships, and one of the things I'll say is about partnerships, and one of the things I, I joke, uh, my wife and I joke about this, the job of a partner is to make the other partner look good. That's our, that's our deal. And of course she says to me, well you better get good so, I can, so you look good. <laughs> and so that's, that's the deal here. Uh, better partnerships by making each other look good, which motivates you to want to look better. Both of you, uh, all parts. So we're, this is really uh, how you get things done, obviously. And, you have, and this is the time to do that here, uh, that, uh, uh, and uh, so we have formal, I guess I'll say formal agreements, although I don't want to make it sound too formal, but the Stewart Foundation has funded us for three years to do three things. Uh, one is, they're not in order of uh, importance, one is to provide advice and support for the core district. So we're part of their, dealing with their secretariat, shaping uh, their get-togethers and uh, uh, design, helping design them and also participating in the so-called delivery. So Joanne and I do that. 
Uh, we're doing uh, case studies of four districts uh, using the professional capital uh, framework, uh, and uh, Long Beach is one of them, uh, Fresno, so two of them are in core, and two of their external core, Whittier and Twin Rivers. Uh, Sandy Thorson of Whittier is chair of CCEE, so we have a, you know, you, you start to cross connect pretty readily. So that's the second one. The third one is in some ways why I'm here today, which is a great, um, a great license to thrill, I gotta say. Uh, and the third goal is to um, monitor, um, keep track of, uh, communicate ab about, and engage in the evolving policy implementation California-wide. In other words, it's a license to do anything. So this is why we have taken that mandate as a legitimacy, uh, in, in our own minds at least, to uh, link in to various groups. So we have, uh, we have a... Uh, an agree we, we have a, an agreement, for example, I'm, well, these are not in order, but an MOU agreement with uh, the Cl uh, California Ed Partners, with Phil and uh, Laura Schwamm and, and uh, others, so that's a two-way uh, looking at how we can help each other. We have an agreement with AXA, uh, Andy, especially Andy and uh, myself to a certain extent, uh, growing agreements uh, with CTA and the, and the developments of what, what could come from this. Uh, we worked with the California Forward uh, in uh, some of this uh, work. I hope we will be involved in the um, reculturing, I'll say, of the State Department of CDE towards compliance, uh, away from compliance towards uh, capacity building with Glenn and, and Tom and others. So at that level, uh, working a lot with Linda Darling Hammond, uh, the School Boards Association, interacting with them, with Vernon. So there's, uh, there's I'm, I'll be missing some, but you get the idea that this is a lot of... Uh, people that are pointing in the same direction who potentially can uh, connect on this agenda in a very uh, very good way. Peter as well with the county offices. Um, um, and, uh, and so it, it, uh, it can come together. And I want to just take you, in the first two slides, one is going to give you tremendous high hopes and the other is going to be stunningly disquieting <laughs> above these high hopes. So here's the, the first one. Uh, this is one of my favorite poems from uh, Seamus Haney, the Irish poet just died last year. Uh, I'll let you read it. You can read it. Uh, hope and history rhyme. What a fantastic thing. Once in a lifetime, hope and history rhyme. Mostly it doesn't. So I think that's what California uh, 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 agenda today means, that this is really a unique time in our lifetimes. We will never see another combination of factors in our lifetimes at such a scale as California. And one of the things I wanted to, one of the reasons I wanted to invest a lot of our effort here is to um, see California lead the nation in how system-wide reform at its complexity can be done successfully. Lead the nation because, and now uh, other, other people are beginning to take note around, uh, around we're getting more uh, uh, calls from uh, other states, Connecticut being one of them, South Carolina, others, about what is going on in California. What does this look like? And we have, uh, uh, we cast this as uh, uh, leadership from the middle. Uh, this doesn't mean there's only leadership from the middle, but I want to start with that concept. Leadership from the middle, if you think of uh, the, the history of this, and we've been at it for, or I've been at it for 35 years, top-down change doesn't work, we know that. Bottom-up change, uh, individual school autonomy or even district autonomy doesn't work. Uh, school autonomy is the enemy of systemness because it's too isolated. So if neither of those work, where's the glue? And we think the glue is in the middle. The middle, we, depending on where you're talking about, but the middle in this case is this districts, the 1,009 or 1,100 districts. And this is why a lot of clustering of districts, of networking of that. And when, the, when this starts to develop, uh, the middle becomes stronger, obviously, but it also becomes better partners, better partners upward and, and laterally, and that, that blue starts to become uh, development. And it was Andy who came across this, and uh, he did a study. Uh, we had him evaluate 10 districts in Ontario, a sample, a random sample of 10, or a structured sample, uh, around how they were implementing special education. And the strategy we had used uh, was, as we... As we um, and, uh, and, and I'm advisor to the Premier and the Minister, as we, I'll say, mainlined a lot of good things, capacity building, literacy, we began to invest in uh, things that we didn't fully control. On purpose, we did. 
So we gave the, the directors of education, who are the superintendents, $25 million to implement a better strengthening of, uh, of uh, special education, but it's really about their, their literacy district-wide. So they, uh, they uh, in some sense, it seems odd to give up $25 million that you can't control. But we controlled it in one way, was they had to focus on, on the agenda, the province agenda, so they, they knew that. They had to uh, uh, hire an external evaluator. They did hire Andy, actually, not we didn't, he, they did. And it was a, high, a big success because they took responsibility for, um, for uh, uh, across for the 72 districts as they interacted with them, as they got things together. And out of this interaction at the middle came a very strong, powerful uh, involvement of uh, more and more people. And they're, ca and they're carrying on now after that project was finished. Uh, these same 10 districts are working as a cluster, like a bit like the core districts. Other clusters are growing. So that when the strength of the middle gets stronger, and the, the guideline I would use is that the quality and sustainability of an organization of a system is a function of the strength of its lateral relationships. Lateral relationships have continuity. Vertical ones don't because leaders come and go. So when you, when you get the middle strong, you get a lot of strength. Now here's the uh, worry. It's not quite poetry, although it's quite, uh, there's the, the person who said it is a writer. This is what uh, Vaclav Havel said in 1989-1990, uh, uh, just after spending a lot of time in the so-called Velvet Revolution, winning Czechoslovakia falling, and then him becoming president. And it's what I call the freedom from versus the freedom to problem. I just did a book, uh, it's coming out in July, that's based on freedom from and freedom to. And I, I'm gonna say that you are at a freedom from juncture. Freedom from means you get rid of constraints. Uh, the wrong accountability system, too much testing. So that's, a, and most people when they get rid of constraints, they declare victory. Uh, but the after freedom from becomes, what do you do with the new freedom? And that's a whole new, much more challenging actually. It's easier to fight against things that shouldn't be there than it is to create things that should be there. That's a harder proposition. So here's what uh, Vaclav Havel wrote, said, felt, the first day on the job as president. And I'm, I'm not gonna read it. I'm gonna just let you soak it in. So I got the freedom. I suddenly had no idea what I was supposed to be doing, <laughs> right? Almost overnight. And later on in the passage, he says, the poetry is over, let the prose begin. The poetry of getting the, re the revolution. Let the prose begin. And that's what, uh, what you're up. So uh, that's what I think is vulnerable. I, I'm going to take the actual agenda rather than a long, detailed presentation on my part of, the, of our concepts. And I'm going to refer to uh, these. This was a, this is an adapted version of the uh, paper I did in 2011, which was called "Choosing the Wrong Drivers for Whole System uh, Reform." And the wrong drivers drivers are policies. Wrong drivers are policies that don't work. Right? Uh, so uh, so then you begin to say, as we said, look down the right hand side. Wrong drivers. External accountability is pretty clear, even though people keep still do, still doing it. Uh, is that every time you, uh, you uh, increase external accountability, people become less accountable. That's the irony. The greater the external accountability, the less the actual accountability you get. Uh, so that's a problem. Individualism is a bit trickier, and I want to uh, just put it that way, that uh, a lot of the strategies that people go for uh, start and stop with human capital. How do we increase the quality of teachers, the quality of leaders, and so forth? <laughs> And uh, as we said in our professional capital book, and I'll say just a little bit about it later, and we'll leave some time for interaction in the whole day too, is that uh, <clears throat> human, you can produce individuals till the cows come home, but if you're not changing the culture, the culture will eat them up faster than you can produce them. So you actually have to produce the team, uh, you have to produce collaboration, collaboratives, and that, because that has more power. It has more lasting power. Digital, I wanna come back to, uh, the main, um, the main strategy for digital, when we think of it, and I, we're actually working on this very deeply, and I think it's uh, something that California has to strengthen, but the main strategy for uh, digital in the last 10 years, the last 10 minutes, actually, for most people, is one word, acquisition. You buy it, that's it, that's my strategy. 
Uh, so, uh, uh, so that you know, that's uh, that's why we say it's not a driver. It's a very important accelerator, and uh, but uh, in ad hoc policies. But you look down the left hand side. Uh, we had capacity building there in the original, and now I've changed it to internal accountability, because internal accountability is capacity built. And we did a paper uh, for Lyndon and John Snyder <coughs> in EPPA. Andy and Santiago and I did that was just published last month called Professional Capital as Accountability. So we took the professional capital concept and said, not only is it a good thing in its own right, but how good could it be for accountability? And the, the argument is, and Richard Elmore said this a dozen years ago, no amount of external accountability will be successful in the absence of internal accountability. Internal accountability when the group gets good, when it holds itself self-responsible, when it's transparent to itself and outside. So that um, argument we wanted to lay out. Well, the other thing that's changed is I've started to use vis-a-vis -vis instead of versus. Vis-a-vis -vis means mean you take it into account. So internal accountability, taking into account external accountability. Collaboration, taking into account. You get the picture. So that's, um, that's the, the kind of re redone frame. That paper hit, hit a responsive chord a lot in California because when things aren't going well, there are a lot of people below the radar who are doing great things despite the system. And when you get them message that shows them life, they respond to it because they know already what it feels like to be successful and what it could feel to be more successful. So I want to put this agenda and I'll, uh, Carlo, I'll give this over, over uh, this kind of uh, deck to Carlo afterwards, 21 slides on it. Here's some things I, I think are, uh, well, obviously essential, but also potentially fragile in, compa in, in comparison. They're not in order of importance, but examples of um, LCAP, and I'm glad we're going to have the LCFF presentation later, but just think about LCAP and, and, and uh, what could go wrong. And first of all, what it signifies and what it, one of the weaknesses of, uh, and, and Chuck has, ri has, has written about this, we called, we've referred to the three stools that are necessary, three-legged stool, I should say, as standards, assessment, and pedagogy or instruction. So uh, the Common Core State Standards, uh, this, they get the standards, they get the assessment, but the vulnerable part is the pedagogy. Who does the pedagogy? LCAP is where you would find, or not, the pedagogy and the capacity builder. It's the place in there. What could go wrong is the following. <coughs> People could uh, treat it as a product. That is, we've got to produce an LCAP plan because we have to produce an LCAP plan uh, to get legitimacy. And we have, as one of our guidelines, uh, beware of fat plans. Uh, because uh, it, planning isn't doing. Planning isn't doing. Planning is, is planning to do. And so if you plan to do something, actually you don't know much about doing just through planning. And uh, well, I love the way that Doug Rees put it a long time ago. He said the size and the prettiness of the implementation plan is inversely related to the quality of action. Uh, so the, the better the plan looks, the less the quality in action. So, uh, so it could be treated as uh, compliance, even if those receiving it don't think of it that way. Those that are doing it might think of it that way. So they do it by, by doing it. It's possible also when you get into, um, and when I interact, because I do with a lot of districts here, we have quite a few relationships with districts and clusters of districts, people are, are worried about uh, the county offices or others uh, taking a uh, compliance orientation to their plan. They're unnecessarily worrying it because I'm saying to them, don't worry, the system is not in the business of compliance right now for the next two or three years at least. So you've got leeway, just do it well. So that's another thing that go around, the misperceptions around that. Another is if you take the eight items, the eight elements, uh, it, LCAP is a, a democratic document. And this is gonna sound a bit strange, but I'm gonna put it this way. You're much better off to spend a lot of time during implementation than you are spending a lot of time prior to implementation. In other words, you can get all kinds of democratic input on the eight dimensions of LCAP, all kinds, and, uh, and what you do is you confuse people, you confuse yourself, you spin your wheels, you end up with something that's unwieldy. So, the big, the big vulnerability, I'm gonna say, is the quality of LCAP plans as a exercise in capacity building. It has to be an exercise in capacity building. It has to be an exercise in action. And this is why uh, one of the things in one of the 
ways of doing this, and it's applied in some others, is that what you want to do is, A, give people help on how they can do that capacity building, LCAP, but also you want to figure out who's getting, who's getting this right, and how can we learn laterally from each other about what, what a good LCAP process is. So I want to tip LCAP into implementation, into capacity building, into its structural development, and, uh, and, and that, uh, that will be the most vulnerable part of the standards assessment uh, capacity building, capacity building most vulnerable. Uh, the CTA were really um, very uh, impressed, I guess I'd say, and encouraged by uh, both Eric and Dean have been up to an Ontario visit. Andy has been working with, with you in different ways. Uh, and I think the, uh, the new management labor relationships and the, uh, that, and that, the, the very indicator that you put out a, a request instead of uh, hoping for 9 or, or 20 or 90 or whatever the number was, there's a growing in interest here. And when I say a partnership, I want to go back to that definition I used. The job of the partner is to make the other partner look good and reciprocal. And so what's good, this is a tough thing to do because this is wholly new, uh, because, because probably I would say in labor management sen sense, uh, people got into the uh, habit of thinking that victory was making the other partner look bad. Right? That was seen and that was felt good. And now this is very different. This is going to be, this is back to the focus on students. This is back on, a, on the health of teachers, on the development of teachers. So that's big. Uh, CCEE, -E, uh, that's a great uh, part we did as part of our Stewart grant. We, <coughs> we've done two reports. They're both on my website, michaelpullen.ca. The first one is uh, November was called California's Golden Opportunity. And we do mean that, Golden Opportunity. Uh, a status report. So that's an overview of a lot of these things. And then we teamed up with California uh, Forward in um, produce the advice to CCEE, which was how to get off as a positive start. Uh, both Linda and I are meeting with, on April 13th with their first, their first meet, their second meeting, but their first meeting to consider what should we do. So that is a very important part. How does that get off? There's a lot of, I can say it, uh, this is without criticism, uh, that CCE knows what it's not going to do, which is a business of compliance, but it doesn't know what it is going to do. That remains to be developed. So big thing to do. Uh, clear advances on state accountability framework. We talked about that. <coughs> this is where our internal accountability is critical, that you have to really get this framework right in a way that it stimulates internal accountability and then protects the system and reinforces the system via its external accountability standards. Very delicate work. And then uh, the work that I hope we will be involved in with you, Tom, in refashioning CDE, changing the culture. One of the things we did in Ontario uh, when we, um, 2004, the beginning of the year, just after the election, we said we want the Ministry of Education, equivalent of CDE, to be a proactive partner with the districts, with the sector. But they don't have the capacity to do that. Therefore, we have to change that. We changed it in two ways. We created a new unit, I'm not asking you to do that, but we did, uh, which was called the Learning Secretariat. We staffed it with a lot of people from the field who were, uh, the, the leader of it was a respected superintendent who came into the ministry to head that. Uh, we staffed it with a, with a lot of uh, secondments, we call them, people, respected people coming in from the field, maybe a third of the uh, staff on a rolling basis for three years at a time, which strengthened the relationships as well as the relevance of the place. But also the deputy minister, the head of that, we said, no, not the new head, we said your job is to develop better two-way partnerships with the sector and to change the cul culture of the Ministry of Education to de-silo it and make it a capacity builder partner. And that's, the, that's what you're about to embark on. So this will be great, we'll, uh, Glenn and uh, others that uh, may be involved in that. That's a big one, because that's going to change the equations. Uh, this one, the, the new pedagogies for deep learning, I'm going to come back to that, under, thank you, under digital, because uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a whole new repositioning of digital that I think has got huge potential. And I think California is not uh, focusing on, on that part sufficiently. And then examples of effective collaboratives, uh, I'll show you a couple of things on this, but. Uh, this is the, uh, I think actually, uh, Stewart Foundation, uh, one of our, uh, either our request or combination request, they took an inventory of the number of collaboratives that were going on in the, in the, in the state, districts working together, other things, and it, I forget the numbers, phenomenal, like 100, 
61, 61 different, and there's growing uh, more and more of them. So uh, these are what makes for an effective collaborative. What do we know about that? And we did, Santiago and I just did a paper, um, partly because of our work in different jurisdictions. Uh, just give you a, like a side illustration here for a moment. Uh, we're working in New Zealand where in 1989, they went to, they call it tomorrow's schools. All schools became on their own, uh, with their own board, 2,500, no districts, zero. So that for the, since 1989, this, some schools got better, some didn't. The gap increased, so the government said, this, does, this isn't working, we better do something about it. So now they've proposed a policy that we're advisors on to uh, implement, to create networks of schools among the 2,500, the networks of schools. And the politics are fierce there, but that's another story. But the concept of networks. So we become increasingly interested either in school networks uh, or in um, other kinds of networks. And these are the eight. I want to give you a, just a sense of uh, what these are. The paper, we just finished it yesterday. It's, it's, it'll, it's publicly available now. Uh, so here's a, this isn't in, in a kind of order, but this is the evidence we found that cuts across a lot of these. These dis, uh, collaborators will only be effective if they're good at all eight of these, if they incorporate all eight. So developing high trust relationships, this is what we call go slow to go fast, build relationships and then accelerate the agenda. Uh, focus on ambitious goals linked to impact. Improve instructional practice through continuous inquiry. Deliberate leadership that's in flat power structures. That means it's not bossy, but it's influential, right? Influential leadership, number, there's a, uh, frequent interaction, learning inwards, connecting outwards to learn, partnerships with an agency for students, teachers, and families in this new relationship, and adequate resources to sustain the work. I was on Monday with Tony Bright and his group in, uh, in the Ca Carnegie, and they have, as you probably know, their, their NICs, the Network Innovative Communities around specific problems, very similar, uh, his six guidelines are very similar to these, his six uh, principles. His book that just came out last week is quite, quite good. Uh, there's another uh, similar list. I just want to give you a flavor of this. You can look at this uh, later as well. In England, which uh, we used to work a lot in and don't really like their policies now, so we don't work there so much, but uh, <laughs> they probably they feel mutual, so that's, that's, that, that's okay. Uh, but they have, done, uh, they have gone into a couple of initiatives that have been impressive. One is the London Challenge, so what it really means that. And uh, I almost think of the California Challenge when I'm stepping back from this, because the challenge is how do we get together to make this the best damn place to work anywhere in the world for education? And so they did that in, in London, and they did uh, they, uh, the, the London um, borough, there's a, I guess about like 20 of them. Uh, we've studied a couple of detail, Andy has as well. Fantastic, they're way above the, uh, they were way below the country average on literacy and numeracy, and, graduation, now they're way above it. Uh, so the second one, though, is also, uh, they just wrote about, is the Manchester Challenge, <clears throat> which was similar, 11 districts in Manchester. Collaborative, get together, re be serious about it. Had the characteristics that I just described, the eight of them. And Mel Ansko, who was the head of it, just wrote a book, and these are his lessons. I just want you to appreciate, when you see them, how obvious, not how, how obvious these are, but how these fit so much with the fabric that you're talking about and the fabric I'm talking about. Here's the half a dozen lessons. Education systems have untapped potential to improve themselves. In other words, the latent goodness in the system hasn't, the strategies haven't extracted that. Number two, school partnerships <clears throat> are the most powerful, etc. That's him saying it, not us. Number three, networking is a means of sharing expertise. And this is all documented in the Manchester Challenge. School-focused strategies have to be complement with engaging parents in the community. Uh, in, in order for education system to become self-improving, the leadership has to come from within, and the state or national government has to do that. This is parallel to what we're talking about here. And this is not theory, although I can make it sound like theory. This is pulling out what works from major efforts. So uh, this is uh, exciting. And then I'm, uh, I want to take a little uh, drive into the uh, digital part because in this book, Stratosphere, just a fancy title for this, a couple of years ago, uh, I, uh, I said there are these three forces that are, have grown up independently from each other. So uh, the digital is pretty obvious. It's the technology and the digital. And I already said the main thing seems to be to buy it. So we said this is getting stronger and stronger. 
uh, and, uh, and, and so you remember it was a wrong driver, but it's not a wrong, it's not a wrong par partner. And then uh, 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 change is the change leadership uh, that I'll give you come, a really succinct definition of change. And this big complex work, and this is actually what Tony says as well, Tony Bright. He said, when you take a problem, he said, you can identify 30 factors that are relevant, but you can't work with 30 factors at once. You have to boil it down to the half a dozen ones that are gonna have the biggest impact. And uh, it's called the Pareto Principle. Uh, if you get the right ones, they have 80% impact. If you try to do them all, you get less. And so they do that, and that's what we do. We boil it down to the smallest number of, of usually four, five, six, and do them well, make them gel. Uh, I use the word simplexity to describe this uh, method. Uh, it's not a real word, but it's a real concept. Simplexity, the simple part is identify the key things. The complex part is make them gel. And that's what uh, we've, uh, we've been doing with change leadership. And then pedagogy or instruction, doesn't matter what you use, it hasn't really, it's not, it's not the teaching profession's strong suit, historically. Pedagogically, the, the knowledge base, many people have said that over the years. But it's all of a sudden, I think in some ways in the last five years, it's becoming much more prominent. Helped a little bit by John Hattie, some of you will know his work, Visible Learning, Visible Teaching, where he's identified with his meta-studies 150 teaching practices and uh, showed, and I'll show you one of his clusters in a minute, uh, how, they, how they affect uh, student achievement, student engagement. So now we have, and this is why I go back to LCAP and capacity, because the capacity I'm talking about at the school district level, or the combination, is really two bins. One bin is pedagogy, the other bin is change leadership. Those are the two bins that you have to have uh, connected. And so we, I said in Stratosphere, these, uh, these three domains have grown up separately from each other over the last 40 years, pick a number, uh, and they need to be synergized if we're going to have results. So that's where I want to take you a little bit. I wanted to give you a little 30-second clip here. We have, yeah, we have Pitzel. A 30-second clip here, uh, just to show you I haven't gone over to the other side on digital. And I still have worries about the, the driver part. So uh, this will reassure you I haven't gone to the other side. Emma. Emma. I hope you got both lessons there. <laughs> Lesson one, technology can do everything, <clears throat> although I'm sure there's going to be an app for it. Don't worry, that, let's not go there. <clears throat> but the second lesson is that, the change lesson, is that judgmentalism is not a very good motivator. And it, actually, it does motivate you to get revenge, but that's not actually what you want. So, uh, so but more seriously, uh, we think of this now, this agenda, because we're working on it, in a project called New Pedagogies for Deep Learning. So New Pedagogies, uh, and I'll define it in a moment, but it has to do with really new learning relationships and partnerships between and among students and teachers and um, families. Uh, so that's the New Pedagogy. The deep learning outcomes are the so-called 21st century skills plus, and they're related. Do the pedagogies in a certain way, you get the, the, uh, the outcomes. And then the question is, where is digital? Digital is an accelerator and a deepener, if you get the first two right. And then you wrap it around with the support structure to do that. So the push and pull factors are these. The push factors are <clears throat> schooling is boring to students, traditional schooling. And there's lots of data that show that as they go up to grade levels, students get more and more bored. One of the principles we filmed said, well, teachers were bored too, but they didn't know it until they saw the alternatives. Uh, they experienced it. Uh, teachers are not only bored, they're alienated by, um, by the uh, upper policies. And if you go back to the uh, wrong drivers, the first two wrong drivers were external accountability and individualism. What, what the, uh, somehow the federal government in one fell swoop has done two wrong drivers together synergistically by teacher evaluation. Individualism and external accountability, double jeopardy. So. Uh, that's why teachers are alienated. The whole big thing here of unleashing and creating a teaching force that's proud to be a teacher. 
and because they're effective, not only because they're morally committed, but because they're effective in the moral commitment. And then the, push, the pushes, I think, are pedagogical partnerships, digital learning, collective efficacy. John Hattie, again, <clears throat> his uh, meta effects, which range from, uh, he said 0 0.40 is my cutoff line below that, it's not worth looking at. His actual findings were there's several below zero, and then they went up, the, 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 the strongest one was 1.44. Recent work, he's, had, he's uh, assessed collective efficacy, he calls it, and it's 1.54. In other words, it's stronger than any of the other 150 uh, instructional practices on its impact in student learning. Collective efficacy means teachers together working in a focused way, well led. And we already know that about collaborative cultures, much stronger in doing that. So we see that uh, part of, uh, this is the graph, it, uh, you, you know this, but it kind of jumps out at you. Uh, when teachers were asked, uh, the teachers at different grade levels, how enthused are your students? Uh, this is the kind of trajectory that, that is found. Uh, pretty discouraging. There's only one thing I can think of uh, that's worse than being bored, and that's having to teach the board. That's <laughs> worse. So uh, this is why we've gone to the new pedagogy. This, uh, we're actually fleshing this out with, uh, with these uh, partners. Uh, we are uh, trying to accomplish the following criteria with the new pedagogy. Make it irresistibly engaging for teachers and students. Make a, this is my, to me the uh, kind of Steve Jobs criterion, which is uh, how do you uh, uh, how do you put the complexity in the design of the technology in order of ease of use? Uh, technologically ubiquitous. This means that learning day is no longer nine to three. It's open ended. If you do the economics of it, you can pretty readily calculate that students are getting twice as much learning by ha having a better daytime and a better evening time around learning, and then uh, steeped in real life problem solving. So this is. Uh, the direction of the digital integration. Uh, here's from John Hattie, his, his effect sizes. And you'll see in doing this that he's clustered these. Uh, this starts to get at the teacher as proactive uh, uh, leader. And you see two things. Teacher as facilitator, 0.17, no impact, hardly any impact. You see a couple of digital things in there. What does that mean? Larry Cuban in his book, The Black Box, has made the same thing. 40 years, no impact from, uh, from digital on learning. And the reason is this, because digital is used superficially, because it's used poorly pedagogically, not because it doesn't have potential, but because it's used poorly. And it has also, I think, with a, a, what teacher as facilitator says, is that the guide on the side is not the right concept. It's too passive. You need more proactivity in there. He has his list, we can, we're upgrading it. So we're trying to change the pedagogy and we're trying to link it to these six C's, and the four, four, four of them, three, four, five, and six, are the ones that are usually called the 21st century skills. I would say three of those, three, four, and five, are, are, are at least present. Creativity, Ken Robinson pretty much assures us it's not present, so those four. And we've added creativity, sorry, character education and citizenship. Character education is uh, what Paul Tuff called grit, or what we could call conscientiousness. Uh, 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 citizenship is appreciation of diversity locally and globally. To appreciation and understanding and engagement of diversity. So very powerful things in, in putting uh, this together. So I'm going to stop in about two minutes and then invite some uh, discussion here. We have until 1040, is that right? Yeah. <clears throat> so this is our image of the educated student when you look at this. It's producing great citizens for tomorrow by making them great citizens today. It's really what John Dewey said 100 years ago, education is not preparation for life, it is life. So my image of the 10-year-old is that the 10-year-old in this engagement, there's no difference whatsoever between learning and living and going to school, no difference. It's all merged into one developmental uh, process in, uh, in this. So uh, we are, uh, in this project, I'm not trying to sell it to you, but it does sound a bit like I am, uh, uh, that uh, we've created it, uh, uh, and, uh, the, the frame of it is to have roughly, and this is only in the average, 10 clusters of 100 schools from 10 different countries, so about 1,000 schools, but those are the average. And we've got Australia is strong, New Zealand is part of that, we've got Canada, we've got uh, Finland. Finland, the minister said, uh, we're changing our curriculum towards this, 
that we, we're slipping. We used to be number one. We've got a, we've got a digital society, but we don't have digital schools, so they're, they're revamping the whole thing. Netherlands, the same thing. Uh, and in, here in this country, we have, um, we have Idaho, who's uh, got a cluster of 100 schools that are working. And we've been talking with uh, Wes and some uh, actually other local clusters here, and the Hewlett Foundation has recently funded us to, uh, <coughs> on the whole thing, but also in particular in mind, uh, increase the U.S. presence. And the reason I want to increase a cluster, or have a cluster in California is that it integrates so, mu so much with the other parts that we're talking about to accelerate and propel it. So I'm going to stop there and have us 15 minutes. But what I'd like you to do is turn to the person beside you just for a couple of minutes and, and discuss these two questions. When you think of the potential here that you know, that I know, that I've tried to outline, when you think of the potential, what's your fondest hope for the next two years? And what's your worst fear for the next two years? Because the next 21 months are do or die on this. You'll never have a chance beyond these 21 months to get it initially right. So fondest hope, biggest fear, worst fear. Either a hope or a fear. Our greatest hope, I, I was in fear, and um, had to do with, well, mine was that uh, we uh, are able to break down the, the culture barriers and that um, there is greater collaboration. Right. We see it happening. We see a lot of interest. And our worst fears, um, that because it takes a change of culture, that it's, it won't happen. Right. Not enough capacity or commitment will be given to it. Okay, so your hope and fears are, are mirror images. And I, uh, I go to, uh, I want to think about Sanger now, where we've worked. Uh, one of their three core beliefs is hope is not a strategy. Right? <laughs> so, so this means that you have to have the goals and you have to have the strategy to be both of them both the goals and the strategy. So hoping for collaboration is a good thing, but what are the actual strategies, the how to it? And the good news is, in one way, is that it takes, it's hard at the beginning to get it rolling, but once it's rolling, it's got incredible momentum. It just, it just geometrically goes, if you get, because it's the energy that's unleashed. So this is why we say go slow to go fast. If you take a little bit of time to build the relationship, not rush too much, but also not be too casual, and then you get a few of the right things going, they go like wildfire. So that's the hope. Back. Okay. The very back. So we were talking about um, our, we are excited because the system is now focused on kids. Yeah. All of these policy changes are about making kids, making us think about what's best for kids. And so our hope was really around um, can we, is making sure that the systems and infrastructure gets put into place so that we can maintain this focus on kids. Yeah. And we're sort of like this group too. I think our, the conference was that our worry is that that isn't going to happen. And okay. that we can't make it happen in this short yeah. amount of time. So all of our statements have to do with the moral imperative linked to measurable impact. So that I want to reinforce what you say. But I want to add one thing. You cannot do that unless it's healthy for the adults as well. You cannot do it unless the teaching force is mobilizing itself. Those go together. And sometimes we just go to, uh, it's great for the kids, and then you forget about the adults. You have to have both. It's synergistic, or you don't get it. Yeah, David. I think one of the main challenges is that um, we stay focused on systems change and, and resist the tendency to regress back to categorical or, or program-oriented yeah. responses to identify problems. Because right. the problems are going to be there, the tendency is to build a new program to solve that problem, yeah. rather than continuously stay focused on changing the system. Good. And that's what our work is about, is, as you know. And the other uh, concept we have, I didn't say it, but we have the concept of system player as a deliberate concept. System player is someone who realizes this is my role but it's also in my job description to contribute to the betterment of a bigger part than me and to, and to uh, receive the benefit from that bigger part. So when we think of just building blocks, the school level, teachers that become from individualistic collaborative, they start thinking about not just my kids in my classroom, but our kids in the school. When districts are in a network, they say, I, I, I don't mind when the other districts are successful as well as mine because I want to contribute to it. That's, those district collaboratives are in it for selfish reasons, I can get better, but they're also in it for altruistic reasons, I can contribute to an entity getting better that makes the whole thing better. 
this is the system idea as well. So we were talking about the, the, uh, the hope that California and all of us and the working units will be able to take advantage of this opportunity, articulate a really clear plan for California, some clear goals, and, <coughs> and uh, make this work. Because to bring everybody along, it, the, the pieces need to come together. They are going to the other that we need to come um, together more and have really clarity about role and leadership because we have yeah. many leaders in, in California and, and clarify that. And here again is the reverse that we that will spawn the opportunity. Okay. And so when you have leaders because the, the and I'm, this is the lead learner concept we have in the principal, for example, but it applies to all leaders. The role of the leader is to build a great culture that does this, but the role of the leader also is to develop other leaders who carry on after they leave. The junior members of the leadership team are the next wave. And if I think of you know, Chris and Long Beach, the culture that they've built, uh, I'm gonna put it this way, this sounds like an insult, but it's actually a compliment. Chris, Chris has built such a culture that he is dispensable to Long Beach. He's dispensable. Carl, same, uh, same idea. So you, you have built something that, that that's what you want to do. You want to become dispensable because the leadership is so powerfully and deep. The idea that we would be so complacent that we can move beyond where we are today, that we would, the, the fear would be that we basically stay at steady state. The upside that we talked about Mm -hmm. support teaching models that support differential strategies for different kids. Yeah, and the, and the LCAP, which I said was vulnerable, is it's going to require, I think, the partnership between the county offices, AXA, and CTA in some fashion. I might, I might have left out somebody, but so it, it, it's a real partnership to make that happen, and it, because it's about buy-in and it's about capacity. And so it's that collective, and any piece that's not there that's relevant is going to uh, make that uh, more problematic. So progress is going to be, and I would say progress, it doesn't come in year one, and you're past year one anyways, because it takes a while to get it established, but within a couple of years it does come, and by the time you're in year three, you better be able to show this is really working, and we're going to go to town on it even more. So that's why I say 2015 and 2016 are absolutely crucial, do or die. number one on our list was developing trusting relationships. Uh, you can't uh, build trust by saying, please trust me, right? <laughs> not, not a very sophisticated strategy. Uh, but you can't, our rule of thumb about it is you name it, you model it, and you monitor it. You say, this, we're going we're, we're to enter in this with a full sense of trust, and we're going to surface things that, don't, that, go, that go wrong, and we're going to build a relationship, but we know we have to do it by proving it. And uh, this is a vital, this is the vital part here. If trust doesn't improve, it, it's not gonna. It's just going to go backwards, because people will be really discouraged if this one doesn't work. The thing I have to be careful about is when we send out the outcap survey yeah. and uh, we post it out there. The majority of responses that I get are from those people that, that either want someone to help them in the office yeah. or they want a coach or what have you. And the most difficult thing and the challenge that I've had is to involve the community, the parents. Yeah. Seventy-two percent of my parents are Latino, and so what I've done is we hired a program liaison, yeah. and I directed them, you know, you're the voice of the parents, so mm -hmm. get those parents to fill out the survey. Yeah. And what I'm finding is a challenge for the parents to, first of all, get online and understand the survey, even after we translate it. So what I try to do is go out and encourage them via my uh, supervisory council or my DLAC, what have you, but now there are a lot more parents filling out the survey, because I need to hear that voice. Yeah. So we went from 250 teachers to 150 parents now. So okay. it's a more even survey now. There's a sense of hope around the systemic approach. There's a sense of hope of being in this room, this systemic mm -hmm. way we're looking at this work. But when we look at the diverse needs of our kids, English learners, kids of lower socioeconomic background, 
diverse racial backgrounds, kids that have really not been served by our system, that probably the fear that I know that I fear is that we're not going to find ways to really address that. That we can label them, we can talk about them, but to really find what works in this transition, not to lose what really works. Okay. And that focus on those So that second one, that, that is the agenda. I mean, it's not like we should include it. It isn't. That's kind of, if you do that, you know, the other things will fall into place. And I think with the parents in the community, uh, and I like what you're doing, but the part I would add is we have found when you build up the capacity of teachers and principals and they get better, they reach out to the community as part of the solution because they're more confident, they see it as part of it. If they don't get better, they play it safe and so you have that struggle. So you need their energy. I want to end with this uh, simplexity definition of the change process just to reinforce uh, this. There's only two ideas in this. And I'm going to say all effective change processes, small or big, do these two things if they're effective. One is that they shape and reshape the quality of the idea. So the idea is not static. And they build capacity and ownership. If you have one without the other, you get nothing. So if you have a good idea without a good process, it goes nowhere. This is why we say being right is not a strategy of change. It has to have a process. If you have a good process but you don't have quality ideas, doesn't add up to much people feel they're wasting their time. So this is, this is a little bit sophisticated, but there's only two things. And I, my favorite example, I'm going to end with this, is we were working in uh, Australia, in Canberra, ACT, the AD schools, and they were stagnant, and the leaders inside, uh, they changed it to the better. But we were, the first year we were in a secondary school, a Canberra high school, and they were, had introduced peer coaching. And so the peer coaching, they trained three peers, they were about to launch into this, and most of the teachers said to us, we don't want this. We don't, I don't care if they're peers, they said, we don't want them coming into our classrooms, observing us and telling us how to teach. So they had a good change process and they came back at, uh, we were there in year three, we were doing some filming and 100% of the, of, the of the teachers were engaged in this, 100%. And uh, I, we looked at that, we talked to them and the teaching was improved, excited, they were learning, great feel in the place. And I, sa I said to the deputy at the end of the day, I said, this is, a, from a change point of view, very, a phenomenon because you had a lot of people who were against it in year one. Now it's year three. It's mostly the same people, and they're embracing it. And I asked them this question. This is what I'd like you to remember. The question was, is this coaching practice voluntary or mandatory? And without hesitation, he said, it's voluntary but inevitable. <laughs> That's what a good change process is, because the idea is good, because the process is good. Thank you very much.